for coming out to the leadership seminar. Um, we've been doing this now for, for those of you who are new, who haven't been here in the past, we've been doing this for about two, three years, bringing in some of the truly best uh, leaders and professionals in the state um, and providing an opportunity where we can just have a conversation about professional passions, um, academic success, uh, and the importance of just uh, contributing and, and building strategies uh, for a professional life that soon awaits you guys in the future. Um, this week we have just a, a fantastic guest, a, a good friend of mine, but, but someone who also just provides great perspective as it relates to the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm going to ask him some questions uh, about his professional career that will probably do far better, and he'll do a far better job of explaining what he has done uh, rather than me just listing off uh, his bio. But, but as you guys know from his bio, there are a couple things that I just wanted to you know, relate, relate to our seminar. First of all, Jeremy Farrell uh, is deeply involved in a variety of, of corporate transactions throughout the state and throughout the country, um, specifically in the area of, of real estate and development. Um, prior to that, um, he was in a, a very significant position within the city of Jersey City, where he was, for all intents and purposes, the general counsel to the mayor, the general counsel to the city. Um, where he addressed just about every potential issue a city has to face, and we'll dive into some of that today. Um, the idea of bringing people like Jeremy in is to really give you guys an understanding of what kind of jobs are out there and how people discover their passions. Um, from there, well, hopefully we can have a dialogue and, and, and maybe uh, peel back the onion a little bit in terms of all the accomplishments that Jeremy has had and the things that he's learned. And hopefully from this, we'll also get a perspective uh, on your end in terms of interest and, and ideas in which you could pursue in the future. Um, so I, I think uh, I'll just start off, as I said, not with any huge introduction on Jeremy, other than to really kind of dive in and, and maybe ask him a little bit about what he does professionally now as, as an executive uh, dealing with a lot of transactions uh, as in, a, in the area of real estate and development and what that actually means. Um, and then, um, and then maybe we'll we'll take a step back and kind of compare and contrast that to to your old job when you were serving uh, the city of Jersey City. So, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing right now professionally. Obviously, the corporate world is far different from the government affairs world that you were uh, working in prior. But talk to us a little bit about what you currently do and what your job is. Uh, first, let me just say it's wonderful to be here, Matt. Thanks for inviting me, and it, it speaks volumes about this institution that so many of you came out on a Thursday afternoon. I know when I was in school, Thursday afternoon wasn't always left for this type of activity, but this is the work, this is the stuff that's gonna really help you down the road, so I'm grateful that so many of you came out. For me, I find myself in an unbelievable place. I, I'm blessed and so grateful because the work I do now, not only is it meaningful, and frankly, not only does it pay well, but I actually love it. I get up every day and I'm enthused about the challenges I'm gonna face in that day. So what is it that I do? I am the uh, national head of government relations for the, one of the largest developers in the country. And what that means is I represent that institution to all the different levels of government and all the different jurisdictions where we do business. So that means when we're building a building, I help them figure out what they're going to have to do from a permitting standpoint, all the way through to what they're going to have to do from an environmental compliance standpoint when they're starting to dig the hole in the ground. I also serve a special legal counsel to the company, and I oversee all the complex litigation, which is anything that we're involved in where the dollars are very significant or the legal theory is, is complex. In all of that, what that means is I work with a team of folks who are pretty much amongst the best in the world at what they do, whether it's the architects and engineers, whether it's the owners, whether it's the finance team, whether it is the actual construction team that's gonna dig the hole, build the, build the building, and of course, government entities. In my daily uh, life, I find myself dealing mostly with problems. Frankly, if everything was easy, they wouldn't need someone like me to help figure out some of these problems. But in solving those problems, I enable 
extraordinary things to happen. When you do the type of work I do, sometimes when people see a building, they drive it down the street, they don't realize all the different people that played a role in making that building happen, this very residence here. And for me, in doing what I do, I do see all the different things that went into each brick that makes this building stand. And I get to say that I'm a part of some of those buildings, and that's a great feeling. So that's what before we, before we back up a little bit and talk a little bit how you, how you got to the position that you're in, when we talk about development, when we talk about buildings, and we relate it back to the kind of work that you're doing, just for some of us in the audience when we're you know, driving around today, tell us a little bit about the kind of buildings, the kind of projects that you're working on so we have a better sense of what that really means. That's a good question. In the audience, how many people have been to Jersey City? That's a good, that's a good number. So for those folks that have been to Jersey City, have you ever heard of a place called Newport? Yeah. Yes. So the company I work for, we built all of Newport. Whether it's the office buildings that's there, whether it's the Newport Mall, whether it's the condo buildings that are there, or the rental residential buildings. And we're still building Newport. So to put it in context, Newport right now is roughly 6,000 rental apartments and several million square feet of commercial and retail space. When you look at a development like Newport, it's easy to see that it's a beautiful community today, but you have to go back about 40, 30 to 40 years and imagine what was there at the time. It was, it was train tracks, there was a little hole in the ground with a hut on top, which was the entrance to the Newport Path Station, and there was a bunch of docks. And what used to happen there were the boats would come in, they would take their containers, whatever they were carrying, from the boat and put it onto a train, and then it would go throughout the country from there. When the company I worked for took over that site, it was riddled with environmental problems, with structural problems, and there was no infrastructure. And when we say infrastructure, what we mean is there was no sewage, there was no electric, there was certainly no fiber optics because it didn't exist. There was nothing. So what my company did is we bought that site, we worked with the state and local government, and we first, we cleaned the property. Then we built the infrastructure, and then we started putting up buildings. When we did that, there was no thought that people would want to live there. But the folks that own my company, what they knew is they had proximity to New York, and they knew they had waterfront views. And so based on that alone, they invested a fortune, and they built what is there today, and it is everything that you could imagine going into a community. So it's everything from the little restaurant we built all the way up to there's many commercial tenants, Fortune 500 companies that are renting office space from us in the, in the high rise office towers. And to say the obvious, um, along with the fact that development means taking a piece of land like you just described and building it and, and providing services and, and uh, value to a community, there's also money to be made, obviously, as well. Um, so uh, again, I, I think what Jeremy uh, does professionally provides a great perspective for us both in, in terms of um, uh, how, to, uh, how to make money when we get out of college, but also how to be in a position where you can, uh, if done right, do really great things. Speaking of really great things, I now want to go back in history a little bit with you and, and talk a little bit about what got you to the position that you're currently in or what helped in your professional development, which is, um, uh, which is ultimately working uh, for the mayor of Jersey City and, and, and serving in, in, as basically the, the general counsel for the city. Um, and w perhaps you can contrast that work a little bit to the kind of corporate work you do now. Sure. Uh, so, First off, get how I got here. Uh, I will tell you, we, there is no plotting a course to end up in the role I have now. You can't sit where you are today and say, I want to be head of government relations for a billion dollar company. Why, why? Because we don't even know what those companies are going to look like in the future. And we don't even know what the true skill set is going to be for that role. And frankly, you know, you guys are already ahead of the game. Because when I was where you were, I didn't even know these types of jobs existed. But what you can do, and what I did, is I threw myself into whatever I was doing in that moment of time. And I remained open to whatever the opportunities that presented from that place in time 
always thinking with the lens of what am I most interested in and what is going to help me do the things that I was most caring about at the time. And that was obviously making a living, you know, being happy, feeling fulfilled, and trying to make the world a little bit of a better place. And so what I would urge everybody here to do is whatever you're doing, you should always think about where you are as a community. You're here at Bloomfield College. This is a community. And you've got to think about how are you fitting into this community and how is this community serving you? Because, you know, Matt, you allude to a very important point, which is, you know, in the work I'm doing today, there is money to be made and I'm making a living. And that's so very important because you can't do all the other things if you first don't have the basic things you need. And to have those things, you need to make a living. But if all you're doing is making a living, then you're really not living up to your full potential, and I believe your full purpose for being here. But if you think about where you are as a community, and you're making sure that you're serving that community, and that community is serving you, then you're on that path. And I think if you do that, as I did, then opportunities start presenting themselves. So my journey really started early on in high school when I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. At the time, I knew I wanted to be a international human rights lawyer, which I'm not. <laughs> and, and I, you know, what happens on someday. <laughs> someday, right? What happens on your journey is just that. You will start off thinking you want to do something, but if you remain open to other opportunities, you'll never know where that path will lead you. And I encourage you to follow that path if it's making you happy. Because as it turns out, while I'm not a human rights lawyer, I every day help make the lives of people better and I help them and I protect them just as a human rights lawyer would do. So I knew I had to do certain things to become a lawyer. You had to do well in school, right? You had to develop a profile of extracurricular activities and folks that would write letters of reference for you. So I did those things and, and those are all things that you have to do getting into college and you have to do to carry you through college. All things you guys should be thinking about right now. But then I knew I had to get to law school. And I won't give you the whole story there, but suffice to say, it's not an easy journey, but it's a rewarding one and I made it through. I got into law school, I made it through law school. But then you get out in law school and you're sitting there with student debt, you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, what should I do next? I was fortunate enough that I got into a law firm that not only taught me how to practice law, but also create a platform where individuals could chart their own course. And one of the things I would strive to tell every person is if you aren't taking ownership of your course, then you're really not on a course. You're just meandering about. You have to chart your own course. And so in doing that, I started learning about what was going on in the state of New Jersey, and how, as a young attorney, I could be helpful in making things better, not just for folks in my law firm and folks I worked with, but for folks that had no idea the work that was being done on their behalf. And in that path, I was fortunate enough to meet a man named Stephen Fulop, who was then a councilman in Jersey City, who had a bold vision for Jersey City and what it could be. And over the course of years of volunteering with him, the councilman in 2013 became the mayor. And remember I said earlier, work hard, throw yourself into your situation, and remember that it's a community. That's all I was doing. I was working hard, I volunteered with the campaign, I remembered it was a community, I made sure that I was giving back to that community, Jersey City, and that campaign. And I was also getting friends, networking opportunities, and educational opportunities. So I learned a lot about how government works. I had learned a lot by then about how Jersey City worked as a community. Who were the leaders in that community? Who were the people that were sustaining that community? Who was most in need in that community? And because of all that, when the mayor won in 2013, he looked back to me and said, look, I need you to be on my team. I was only out of law school five years, and I certainly wasn't the type of candidate for the role of corporation counsel, general counsel to the city, that most people would look to. But the mayor knew what I had done with him over the last several years, and he said, come join the team. In fact, come be one of the main leaders of that team. 
And because I did the things I told you earlier, and I remained open to opportunities, I accepted that role. And it was an immense challenge because you had to learn a lot, but at the same time, you had to do the job. So what I would tell you is when you're taking on these opportunities that present themselves, remember that there's nothing wrong with knowing what you do know and knowing what you don't know. In fact, that's the most important thing, probably the root of my success. Because when I came across the things I didn't know, what I was willing to do was ask for help. And I found that help from so many different places. And being able to identify what you don't know is step one, but then learning where you can go to get the help is step two. And then, of course, step three is obvious. You accept that help, you follow it, and you do the best you can with all of the tools you've amassed. And that's what we did for, for six some odd years in Jersey City. And because of the work that was happening in Jersey City, and you know, this is another reason why you can't plot a course from, from where I was to the job I have today. Because the opportunity that presented itself to me was Jersey City. But what was happening at the time in Jersey City was in part because of the work that the mayor and those of us that served the mayor were doing but also just because of all of the confluences of circumstances that made Jersey City the fastest growing city in America, and made Jersey City the most diverse city in America, and made Jersey City one of the most desirable places for people to invest. And because of all that, people were building. And so me, a lawyer who was actually a litigator at a law firm, relatively junior, all of a sudden, I'm the general counsel of the city that had to do billions and billions of dollars a year in real estate transactions and development deals and make sure that the residents of Jersey City got the most amount of value out of all that opportunity possible. And in figuring all that out, some folks took notice. And at the end of that journey, people started knocking on my door and saying, we want you to help us out. We want you to take everything you learned and figure out how you could be of service to the mission that we have. And in listening to all those opportunities, I went back to the same principles that I talked about earlier today, which was I thought about what I was looking for, and I thought about which one of those opportunities came from the type of community I wanted to be a part of, and the type of community that would serve me back. And I picked the frack because not only as I said to you earlier, does the job pay me, which is important, but it allows me to help shape large-scale communities across this country. Because when LaFrac's going to a community, we don't build a building, we build neighborhoods, we build cities. So right now, for instance, I'm working on a project in North Miami, which is gonna be another some 7,000 residences and another millions of, millions of square feet of commercial and retail. We're doing projects all over the country, whether it's in LA, or it's you know gonna be in other places in Florida, or whether it's gonna be in Seattle, or New York, or wherever we're doing business. Because of the platform that LaFrac gives me, I can still continue, not just to serve one community, but to serve multiple communities. And the role I play at LaFrac is the role where I get to go back to that team I outlined for you before, of the architects, and of the owners, and of the finance people. And I get to say, this is how we enter that community. And this is how we become a part of that community. And to do that, this is how we're gonna serve the various constituencies that make up that community. I hope that's an answer. Wow, it sure is. Um, I, I, I do wanna go back to something, though, because it, it kind of rings true to those the whole reason behind this seminar class and, and also uh, picks up a, a very important theme that has been constant with each of our sessions, which is about really creating your own luck. So really what I, I wanna just kind of point out to everybody is that by Jeremy knowing what he wanted to do in, deci in deciding at a, a somewhat of a young age that he was interested in the law and focusing just simply on that passion and then working his butt off, things kind of began to fall into place and luck was created. Is, is that somewhat of a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, 
It's truly about positioning yourself to take advantage of the opportunities when they come. So talk to us a little bit about how you found that passion. I mean, why the law? I mean, it would be easy to say, okay, how did you get to, you know, Mayor Phillips' office? How did you get this job? But really, at the end of the day, it starts at that beginning, that beginning point. That created the domino effect. Yeah. What, what is it about the law, and how did you discover that about yourself growing up, that that was something that you wanted to sort of lean in on? You know, it's, it's a good question. Uh, when I was coming up, you know, there was a lot of things happening in the world that as a young person, they weren't easy to understand. But what was easy to understand was that not everybody enjoyed the type of life that we enjoy. And so at a very young age, I asked myself why that is, and I didn't know. So I started asking adults around me, you know, why is it that? Some people don't have the necessities they need. Why is it that in some countries people, you know, can be arrested and, 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 and disappear? You know, these are the types of things that were going on, you know, not, not to get on a pretty somber conversation, but, you know, when I was coming up, you know, people were talking a lot about places like that were having, they were experiencing genocide and that were experiencing civil war, you know, and in the 90s there was a lot of countries taking shape, changing, developing constitutions. And I was asking, why were these things happening? And eventually I started getting to answers. And those answers came back in fairly simple form. So as a young person, I can understand, which is in the countries that, in, in, in countries like ours, there's a thing called the rule of law. And the rule of law is the framework under which we all agree to live. And it creates a set of rules that we all agree to follow. And if you follow those rules, then Life is not perfect for folks, but it's better. And it's easier to figure out the problems when they do present. And I thought to myself, wow, that makes a lot of sense. How do I, how do I become a part of that? How do I help reinforce that? And obviously, human rights law. <laughs> it made a lot of sense to a young person uh, that it would be a, a reasonable and easy uh, profession to attain. But what I would tell you is, uh, in making that decision, I don't want to delude anybody. You know, it, it's easy for me to sit here right now and, and say, yeah, you just, just work hard and, and you just figure out what you want to do and, you, and, 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 and then you go out and you do it. But there are going to be trying times along the way. And certainly for me, in, in, in my journey, you know, uh, there were a lot of times when I didn't think it was going to work out. Whether because I had to go to school, like I'm sure many of you did, or are going to school on full student loans. And when I graduated college, I didn't think that it was going to be financially feasible to go to law school. You know, um, but if you keep working hard and you keep looking for those opportunities, and, 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 and when you're looking for those opportunities, you choose the one that's most exciting. You enjoy the different steps in the journey. And so it may take you to a different place. That's why I didn't end up being a human rights lawyer. But I had, you know, a lot of fun and interesting experiences on the way that reinforced the, the drive. Yeah, so I think what you're talking about is not only the importance of education and how that education helped bring about luck and opportunity, but also the importance of persistence um, in dealing with a, lot, with a lot of the challenges that, that you are faced growing up and when you're in that development phase. How, what kind of advice would you have for those in the audience that you know, are, are still in the process of trying to discover their passions and discover you know, that, that focus, that clarity of where, where they want to go? Well, I would tell you there's, first of all, it's almost all of us don't truly know what it is we want to do. It's the, it's the, it's the exception, not the rule, for the person that has a clear vision. And as in my case, even when I had a clear vision, that's not what I ended up doing, and yet I sit here still extremely happy. So the first thing I would tell you is don't worry about not knowing exactly what you want to do if that's where you find yourself. But what I would tell you is, it's the same thing I said at the beginning when I first started to, to speak. Whatever you are doing, really commit to it. Really throw yourself into it. Try to be the best at it. And then when you're making your decision as to where you want to go from there, look to those places where not only do you think you're gonna find something interesting to do, but that it's gonna be a community that serves you. Where is that next opportunity that's going to help you grow as a person, maybe in the direction of something that you want to do? 
but it's going to give you skills that will help you be successful, that maybe you're going to meet people that you find interesting. You know, it's funny. When you talk about you know, the general theme here today of why go to college, there's a lot of business case for that. You know, we could talk about how folks with college degrees are going to make a significant more money than folks without. You know, right now, for instance, the stat for 2018 is something like a high school diploma is $700 a week and pay, a college degree is like $1,700 a week. It's like 60% or more a week in pay, right? Those are the obvious reasons, and I implore you to look at them. What we don't talk enough about are the intangible things like meeting people and that network, that network that will sustain you, not just from a business standpoint, which it will, but from a human standpoint. They're gonna become your lifelong friends. When you do hit those roadblocks, it's those people that you're gonna to turn to for that next opportunity. That's how you create those opportunities because you'll never know who in this room is gonna be the person that opens the business and then is gonna need your services. You never know who in this room is gonna become the next elected official or the next academic person and that's gonna create an opportunity for you. And so what I would tell you is as you're on those journey, I, I, <laughs> I get quite, you know, transactional about it in a way, and I say I collect people. But as you're on that journey, and you're in the one opportunity, and you're throwing yourself into that opportunity, look at the other people that are similarly situated, and that are throwing themselves in that opportunity, who are good people, and, and try to grow your network by including those people. Because that's the truest route to success, is growing that and building that network. And the other thing I would tell folks is remember that it's a journey. So you don't always have to choose the decision that you're faced with in the moment that is either the most lucrative or the easiest or the most obvious. Remember that it's a step. And so make sure when you're thinking about it, think about how that next step is going to help you get to even the step beyond that. I want to go back to, I have a couple more questions on my end, and then I do want to open it up to the floor, because um, I'm sure there will be a lot of folks who want to respond or, 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 or ask some specific questions. I want to go back to something that you said before, though, about when you went over to, to Jersey City and you were very young, um, and you were serving the mayor, and you weren't the quintessential general counsel that traditionally might be in that position, and how you were basically doing the work and also learning along the way. That must have been an extraordinarily challenging environment, especially considering it was so new. And I think all of us in some capacity, no matter where our age of, have faced significant challenges, whether they be academic or social or eventually professional. How, do you, how did you manage that? I mean, how did you get through that moment where, I mean, we all, you know, for those of us who know you, we now know how much you do know, but how did you get through those initial challenges? And, and let me ask you this, too. let me expand it. How did you get through those challenges even back in the days when you were in academics and you, know, you were trying to think about how am I gonna pay for, for, uh, for law school? I mean, these are significant challenges that would traditionally be a roadblock for just about anyone. Right. But you were able to kind of get through those and, and not be intimidated. Where does that come from? What did you do? You know, it's, <laughs> that's a great question. And the reason why it's a great question is because it gets to a point that when I'm having these types of conversations, I always like to make. Uh, which is that I didn't do it alone. When I went into corporate counsel in Jersey City, I'll never forget, the day after I said yes to the mayor, I called my best friend, who happened to also be a lawyer, probably one of the best lawyers I've had the, the good fortune to meet. And I remember saying to him, look, I, I just made a big decision, and now i got to figure out how to pull it off. Can you take a little time to meet me and, and I want to talk through some of these things with you. And I knew then that I was going to ask him to come and be my second in command. But I also knew that he was newly, he was married, you know, he was, you know, starting his family, doing all those things, and it would be a major pay cut. So I didn't quite know how to, to, to ask him that question. Um, and what we ended up doing, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, we went and we saw a movie. Uh, and. I personally couldn't even tell you what the movie was because the whole time during the movie, I was just thinking about how am I going to ask him this question. Uh, so the movie lets out, and I say to him, hey, why don't we go grab a quick bite to eat or something? 
And he says, no, I really gotta get home. So now here we are in the movie theater parking lot, and I turn to him and I say, uh, his name's Jason, I say, well, then I guess I have no choice but to do it now. And I say, I say Jason, uh, would you consider coming and being my first assistant? And <laughs> Jason looks to me and he says, you know, I had a feeling you were gonna ask me this. And I spent the whole time watching this movie, figuring out if there was a way to say no. <laughs> and he said, but the reality is, is um, you know, uh, there's no way I would let you go and do this alone. And I'm gonna stay here with you. Wow. So the, what I'm telling you there is, is it goes back to my previous comment about that collection of people, that network. At the very least, I knew he was someone I trusted who I could talk through some of these issues. But at the most, what I knew is I, he was someone who I could trust to come in and be there with me and support me. And, I, and we knew that with Jason coming in, he was also a litigator. One of the many functions of Corporation Council is to oversee all the litigation facing the city. I knew I had someone now who I could put in charge of all of that and I would never have to worry about it again. And so what I did is I started with Jason and then from there he and I built out a team of people that collectively we now knew we had the best lot apartment in the, in the state. Not because, you know, we felt like we knew all of what we were doing, but because nobody was going to work harder and we weren't doing it, as I said, because of the money. Because while it did make pay us enough to survive, it was not a well-paying job. But what we knew is that we were committed to serving each other. We were committed to serving the community that we built, and that through that commitment, we were going to make sure that we all collectively succeeded. That's all. No, that's that's a really important answer. And final question before I open it up, um, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot and I'm going to embarrass you, but but I, I I think it's important because it's an important characteristic that you, that you embody through the years that I've known you. Um, I want to I want to talk about something a little different, which is something that we don't often see in politics and government and, and in the corporate world. But I want to talk about kindness, and and you know I I think from, the, from as long as I've known you, I mean what has always been of huge import to me is not just your knowledge, your experience, the relationships that you have, but just the fact that generally speaking, while I'm sure there are bad days as well um, <laughs> as there are with most of us. Let's talk a little bit about the importance of kindness, whether it be in the classroom, in the workplace. Um, how important is that? How is that a distinguisher? And, and, and how is that something that was instilled in you? Um, because I think often when we talk about success in the workplace, um, we often go down this lane where we're like really focused on ourselves, we're really focused on reaching that goal at, all, at whatever cost. Um, but to do it with grace, to do it with, 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 with kindness, that is a rare form and it's, a, it's something that, you know, even at 48 years old, you know, I, I think I'm better at it than I was when I was 28, but, you know, it's always a challenge. It's something that, that you obviously have taken in as a high, uh, important priority for yourself. Talk to us a little bit about the importance of kindness. Uh, first of all, you know, kindness is the most important thing. How we treat each other as human beings, how we treat, you know, the other lives that we come across in our journey, whether it's the planet, the animals, how you treat everything is the most important thing in taking ownership of yourself and your journey, right? Because at the end of the day, the, the easiest thing for you to control is also the hardest thing for you to control at times, which is yourself. And it was instilled in me by my parents. So I, it's no complicated answer. I'm very fortunate. I have great parents who, you know, were not perfect, but who always said to us, you have to be the best possible person you can be. And in part, that means treating people as you would want to be treated and treating people with kindness. And then they lived it. You know, in my house, I always joke, in my house, there was always somebody, we had a, a room in the basement, there was always somebody living in that room in the basement. And I would just be told, it's a family friend. But it's because my parents would not come across someone that was trying to figure something else out and needed a place, and if they had an extra place, would not give it up. You know, my parents, uh, 
were the kind of people that if we were making dinner, you know, we didn't just make dinner for the family. We made enough dinner that whoever came by could also eat. And every, you know, week there were folks coming by. So that's where it started. And as a kid, you kind of just go along, sometimes you're forced along. But then as a young adult, I really started buying into it. Again, and I hate to be so repetitive, but again, because of this understanding of community and how community works, I realized that what I'm putting out in that community comes back. And so I was of service to everybody else in that community. If you can be of service to other people, that's the truest form of kindness, right? If you're helping other people in what they're trying to do and surviving and succeeding. And what I learned, it's quite selfish, man. What I learned is whatever I put out there, I got way, way, way more back. Exponentially more back. And so that's kind of how it, how it started. But I also realized that it started making me feel more positive. You know, no matter what I was facing, the kind of material things, which can be fun and I enjoy, but they never brought me as much as the pure act of just being nice, trying to help people out. Now, that's how I try to live my life, but it is a practice. And I have many a times when I am not as kind as I would like to be. And I reflect on those times and then I try to do better the next time. It is a practice. And one of the other things I talk about is it's not always just about being kind outwardly. Because again, the easiest thing for us to control is often the hardest, which is ourselves. And so we have to be kind to ourselves too. We have to love ourselves too. So I try to do it both ways. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to open it up, uh, and, and I hope that uh, some, of the, some of you guys have uh, reflected on some of these great words of wisdom. and. Um, perhaps we can have a, a little bit of an engagement. I know that we're running a little late, um, or we're close to running late, but um, hopefully we, uh, we have some questions, anyone. And I'm gonna hand a microphone over to whoever may want to indulge first. Nobody? Come on, guys. Not one question? I don't believe it. No one? No one. Everyone's looking down. This is, this is a great opportunity to engage. Uh, with Jeremy Cohen. I have a question then. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. The woman who's putting on her coat, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> you. You're the one who's looking away from me. <laughs> what's your name? Paola. Paola. Yeah. Paola, why did you come here today? <laughs> to support, to um, see the student, to see um, what you had to say to the student also. Thank you for coming oh, and supporting. So what would you say to the students? That it was great on the gum. <laughs> <laughs> that was not nice. That it was great to come. And I, I really agree with what you're saying. Um, connections is everything. And every, um, every person that you meet, you never know who you're sitting next to. So it's always good to network with um, other people. Thank you. Okay, I'll pass the mic over. Oh, OK. I'm pretty loud, but. <laughs> Uh, just talk a little bit um, I think we all at some point in our lives come to that time when it's the turning point. And you kind of referenced that there were some times in your life when things were challenging. Um, and I think, we, you know, you live long enough, there's going to be that moment in your life when you see the light bulb goes off and say, you know what, something's got to change. When was that for you? And can you describe what the feelings were associated with that? I've, met, I've had many, many uh, crossroads in my life. Uh, but I think the one that's going to be most interesting for folks here is when how I came about making the decision to go from private practice to a corporation council job. So I, I shared with you all of the things about being involved with the mayor and volunteering and the community and the mayor asking. But what I didn't share is at the time I had a very comfortable job at, at the time, the largest law firm in New Jersey. Great group of folks, great firm, um, but the firm life was starting to become less of what it was when I started there. Whereas if you remember, I shared with you that the firm I was at was the kind of place that let you chart your own course. Well, in its exponential growth, 
we were moving away from that type of model to a more traditional model where you had to kind of work big cases and, and you know and really you know be at the firm for long hours and, and focus in on s small little pieces of a case because that's what complex large litigation requires and that's what the business of the law requires when you're doing it from a defense for profit large scale uh, you know law firm and after a couple of years of doing that and sitting in a conference room uh, day after day, night after night, I realized that I was no longer doing what I was passionate about and what had called me to the law, and that I was actually spiritually no longer satisfied and happy. And I'll never forget, there was about four other folks who I was really, really enmeshed with a, with a case on that were feeling the same way, but no one verbalized it. And finally, a, a more senior attorney verbalized it. And she said uh, it was late at night, and it was probably uh, late in the week, like a Thursday. And we had spent every night that week on this case together. And she said, you know, we all have to collectively agree that we're going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that in two years' time, we're not still sitting in this conference room. <laughs> And that meant different things for the different people in that room. But for me, what it meant was I wanted to take back control of what I was doing with my profession <coughs> and what I was doing to help serve my community. So that is how I got involved and decided to volunteer for the Philip Camp campaign. Right. Because I wanted to do something of more purpose and I wanted to utilize my legal talents to do that. And because of that, that's what put me on the trajectory to then ultimately get the opportunity. But it was the act of that senior attorney verbalizing what we all had been feeling and then a change we made that pushed me to say, okay, I'm going to do something. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was going to do something. And, and so when I knew that I had to make the change, I started asking more senior mentors of mine. And mentorship has played a major role in my life. And, Matt is here, who's been one of my mentors. And he's very kind to say friend, but you know, when I first met Matt, it was a lot of like, what should I be doing next, Matt? Conversations. <laughs> and, and so I encourage everybody to go find a mentor. And finding a mentor means finding someone you admire and look up to. And just like everything else I said, it's about you know, asking questions and working hard and showing yourself to be worthy of that mentorship and then getting that mentorship, but also giving back, you know, being a, a real friend to that mentor and, and helping that mentor when you can. But uh, I digress. So the mentors were the ones who helped me figure out that maybe the best thing isn't to just go quit your job, like, like some days I was thinking, but rather find opportunities to be fulfilled outside of the job and then you never know when they'll take you. Great. I think we have uh, one question and I do know that uh, from a scheduling standpoint, I'll say a couple of final remarks, but um, I think we have another question. It's not so much a question, it was just a comment. I just wanted to say thank you for talking about, you know, being kind um, and letting the students know that it, it is a, a practice to be done every day because a lot of um, our students are struggling with different things and I think they need to hear it from someone of success that even with success, you still practice to be kind because we just don't know what people are dealing with and it's important just to show kindness at all times. You know, you raise a very important point of, of what other people are dealing with. The most basic form of kindness is that empathy. You know, someone cuts you off, someone slams the door in your face. It's so easy to lash out, and oftentimes we all do. But you don't know what that other person that just did those things to you, what they're experiencing, what they're going through, what, what absenteeism you are in that moment compared to the bigger, weightier things that they're targeting. So true. So um, just a couple quick things. Uh, normally when we do the, this, uh, this seminar, we do it on Tuesdays. Uh, we, we moved it over to Thursday for this week to um, be able to, to bring Jeremy onto campus. So I can tell, obviously, that uh, there are obviously some folks in the audience that have had to leave for other scheduling reasons. Um, but most importantly, I just, want, I just really want to thank our guest, uh, Jeremy Farrell, who um, has really provided us, I think, with a lot to think about, a lot of great perspective. 
Um, and I think the most important thing, and, and hopefully we'll hold them to this, is that you know we've now made a really important connection uh, for Bloomfield College, and, and hopefully there'll be other opportunities where we can have Jeremy here um, to talk to us and, and to provide his perspective and get his involvement uh, on the great things that are happening on the campus level. Um, so I want to thank Jeremy for coming. Um, we're thrilled he's here. I want to thank all of you guys for coming and, and, and listening to, to some great lessons that he's shared. Um, I think if we're lucky, he, he could stick around for a couple more, just a couple more minutes after this if, if anyone wanted to just introduce themselves or, or shake hands or, or grab his business card or whatever it might be. Uh, we're lucky to have someone uh, of, of his experience on our campus. And uh, so with a final word, just wanted to thank you for coming, man. Thank you. Thank you.